So yeah, I'm going to talk about scaling infrastructure as code. And, and uh, to, to start with that, I want to talk a little bit about um, how it is that infrastructure helps with our organization's strategy. Because I think this is something where it often seems very disconnected because there's a lot of things between you know, what we're doing with our, kind of our Terraform code and whatnot, um, or Plumi or whatever it is we're writing our, our infrastructure code in, and like, the things that like, you know, the CEO and the board and those kind of folks are, are thinking about. But I think a lot of times that disconnect leads to a lot of the issues we have around you know, where you get frustrated because we don't have time and say the resources and things we need um, to you know, really make our systems. We're firefighting all the time and we have these kind of problems that we could really address if we like, kind of you know, took some time to make improvements to things. And then on the other side of it, the, the, the folks at the top level are kind of like, um, they don't necessarily understand like, why, you know, what they're spending on, right? They know like, we're demanding, you know, we need these things and those things and they're spending money on stuff, but it's not always very clear to them like, you know, how does it relate other than just a, a cost center? So it's worth thinking about. So like growth is an obvious one, right? As a, as a business, our, our uh, you know, strategy might be we want to you know, add customers, market share, all that kind of stuff. And obviously that means, you know, can mean certain things about our infrastructure. What do we have to be able to provide to kind of support you know, the goals there? Some more kind of specific things are like you think about like regional expansion. So like I work, um, or sorry, volume being that first one, uh, regional expansion like globally and that kind of thing um, will impact how we build our infrastructure, particularly the ways that we do that. So I've worked with, um, uh, you know, I worked with one client where their goal was to, uh, or their plan was to, they would be, be expanding into, into other regions around the world and, and they needed to set up cloud there. They would sign up like a partnership with somebody in a different region and, and they wanted to go quickly, right? They would say like, we want to be able to kind of turn it around in like a, a two weeks. And the way that the uh, infrastructure was built, so it was on AWS with Terraform, was that um, they weren't really set up to be, be able to do that very easily in a sustainable way. So they would like copy all the Terraform code they had for the one region, for the last region they did basically, into another folder, make a new project for that, and then, and then edit it and make it for the new region. Um, and that was hard to sustain over time. So for one thing, like all the older ones, like it got kind of would, would like get older and older, right? Because you'd make improvements to the new stuff that you couldn't very easily roll back to the old stuff. And then when it came to doing things like patching, um, you know, they would have a hard time having to kind of do it across all the different code bases and then test it and apply it across all of them. So they couldn't scale very well. Um, and then in other cases, there are things about thinking like data. So I, um, another kind of group I worked with, the infrastructure team was approaching this problem by saying, we're going to, you know, we've got the, the, the how are we going to build, we, we're using CDK, we're going to build, uh, you know, a new instance in, in each region. And because we know that like data privacy is a thing, there's going to be like, no connections. So the first client I was talking about, they were sending all the data back, or they started out, we're going to send all the data back to the one region where we do our reporting and all that. And then they obviously ran afoul of um, you know, data protection stuff. This organization, the technical folk, um, who, by the way, were very resistant to having conversations with like, product folks and, and people on that side. They were like, that's BA's problem. We're building infrastructure, right? That's our thing. We're going to build the infrastructure so that the data is separate in each, uh, you know, in each region. And that, of course, meant that customers who might be roaming between regions, their accounts wouldn't work across regions. And they hadn't had the conversation between the product teams and the infrastructure teams to understand you know, how, how you know, these things needed to connect and how they needed to work. Um, so that was bad. Um, the product expansion, so like we need to be able to kind of add new products quickly. Um, so like what does that mean? Again, this is, this is like thinking about like what are the expectations from the business? You know, if, we, if the business, they come up with a new product idea or they want to make changes to products, what are the expectations for how long it's going to take to set up, say, all the kind of build and test environments and, and if there needs to be separate production environments or resources, like how long is that going to take? So it's just a matter of kind of setting those expectations um, so that we can make sure that we can, we can deliver to those. And then like acquisitions is another big one, right? So some companies do a lot of acquisitions of other businesses, often to meet those other objectives, right? We're going to add more, you know, some, uh, a similar business and they've got customers, we're going to bring them onto our platform or maybe uh, we're going to acquire a company in another region so that we can get a presence there acquire products and so on. So how, what is the strategy for integrating the infrastructure for that, right? Is it just going to be, they're going to continue being separate and we're just going to kind of integrate for like maybe, I don't know, data and things like that? Or are they going to expect to come onto our platform or, or, or what, right? So it's important to have these things in mind. And then that's the kind of growth oriented stuff. There's also just like effectiveness oriented stuff, right? So we need to think about, the, there's the modernization, right? Which is always a big thing. Oh, we want to kind of move to the cloud and adopt the latest technologies. We want to kind of move off of 
a lot of cases, mainframes and, and um, stuff that I worked with 20 years ago. Like I've you know worked with a client where they're doing like um, moving off of like you know uh, you know Java, uh, WebSphere, and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's now legacy, right? And so you get you gotta we gotta be continuously doing that. And so again, what do we have to do with our infrastructure to make it possible to do that? Um, and cost alignment, by which I mean, uh, well, cost management, making costs visible, making it possible to kind of scale up and down um, according to you know, how things are going with the business or the cycles or what have you. And finally, just operational quality, by which I mean things like you know, performance, um, scalability in that sense of capacity, resilience, and so on. In some cases, like most of the time, this stuff doesn't come to the attention uh, to the, the, the folks at the top of the organization, but it can, right, um, usually in bad ways. So, what are things that make this difficult? Um, so first of all, there's, and I'm thinking about when it comes to like building our infrastructure, and infrastructure is code to meet those kind of needs. Um, code sprawl is a big thing, I see. So what I mean by that is, um, you know, our code base, our, our Terraform or CDK or, or Plumia, or whatever our code base is, it grows organically, and over time it just becomes messier and messier. So we do those things like copying things from here to there and tweaking them for this or for that. Um, and just like more and more stuff gets added to it. And so, um, you know, I've known teams where it, it took, when they ran Terraform Apply, it would take two hours um, for it to complete. All right. And so uh, we have to think about ways of dealing with that. Um, that leads to inconsistency, obviously. So, like, more, especially in those cases where I talked about where you're copying things and editing it for a different product or, or region or what have you, um, the, things become more and more inconsistent. You get that kind of configuration drift. And so when you do want to make a change, you can't easily roll it out across everything because it's going to behave differently. So it will break thing. It might work in one place and break in another. Um, which then makes things hard to change. <clears throat> and one of the things I run into is uh, this idea that with infrastructure it doesn't matter so much, right? So as I'll talk about later, I'm a big advocate of doing things like having automated tests and pipelines and those kind of things for infrastructure code. Um, and I, I, I still run into people who are like, well, we don't really need that. You don't need to kind of write code for that stuff because you're just going to build an environment, you set it up, you'll test it when you build it, and then you're done with it, right? You're not going to mess with it. But then, like, next week there's a security vulnerability and you've got to patch it. And you've got to patch all your things. Um, or you've got to update. Just you don't want it to kind of, you know, over time, you don't want to find out that you're running stuff that's like two years behind on, on updates and patches or old versions of, of, you know, system components like databases or whatnot. And you, know, you want to kind of be able to keep those updated at least, even if you're not talking about rolling out new product features and things all the time. So I guess it's just that kind of mentality that you know, we have to you know, realize and make sure that people understand infrastructure does change continuously, and it needs to be easy to change it. If you don't make it easy to change it, you know, this is where you get your problems, right? And then just where we spend a lot of time on kind of low value work, right? On, on um, I don't know, glue stuff and scripts to, you know, um, I, how many folks here have scripts to run their infrastructure tools like Terraform and all that, right? Um, yeah, I mean, like most project, most teams that I, that, I, that I work with, it's like you've got, and they're all kind of their own snowflake custom special, you know, um, thing from team to team. And then we spend a lot of time on that. I've worked on teams where we're spending more time maintaining that and fixing problems that break in the scripts that run the tools um, that do our infrastructure. So that's really stuff that it'd be nice not to have to spend a lot of time on. And then a lot of times the way I think we build platforms with our, uh, you know, from our infrastructure can be disempowering to teams, which I'll talk a little bit more about. <clears throat> so the kind of overall, I guess, themes that I, that I talk about in, in terms of how to be able to kind of scale up is to think about platforms as something that we build collaboratively, so it's not as a centralized thing, but like how to kind of different people and different teams collaborate together to, to build what they need from the platforms. Um, the infrastructure architecture, making that composable so that you can kind of build different pieces that kind of integrate nicely together and can be smaller pieces. Um, and then being able to continuously evolve and again update and improve and, and all that kind of stuff, our, our infrastructure code. So like platform is the kind of the way that we, we tend to kind of want to handle this stuff. We're going to stick something in the middle, we have a cloud, and then we'll have a platform on top that developers can use, right? So there's kind of a couple of ways that people think about this. One is, um, oops, where is the headline? Oh, it's on the top there. So the, uh, some, some people will think, you know, we're moving to the cloud and that's our platform, so we don't need to think about this stuff. We're, we've signed a deal with a cloud vendor and we're just gonna like let developers loose on it. <clears throat> and the problem is like, this is what you get from, from cloud vendors, right? You get a whole bunch of different pieces. Um, and Corey Quinn had the article on 17 different ways 
to run a container on AWS. Um, and then he had to follow up 17 more ways to run a container on AWS. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we have to kind of think about, um, you know, if you let everybody loose on it, um, then you're going to have a lot of kind of um, inconsistency and overlap. And I say unnecessary inconsistency because it's not uh, necessarily a thing that you need everybody to be doing things in exactly the same. Um, but it's like a lot of times it's like that's, there's, there's not a reason to be doing things differently than another team is doing it if you, if you can't help, if you can help it. Um, and again, it makes because every, if everybody's got all their kind of different things that they've implemented in different ways, and especially if there's dependencies between them, that again makes changing things hard. You want to change something, but you might break something that somebody else is doing. Um, and uh, there's also that kind of, again, the cost thing. So not having the visibility of how much we're spending when everybody's doing things, you know, <laughs> gets, gets out of control. Um, and uh, the operational quality, right? So some teams will be really good at maybe like performance or security or whatnot, but not everybody's going to be as good. And so how do you kind of like share you know, that, that, that experience and that knowledge um, rather than just kind of haphazard. So the other way to think about it, well, the positive thing is the paved road for developers, right? Paved road is nice. You give developers a road where they can, you know, the, the easy path to kind of do things and as long as they can go off road. But for a lot of uh, organizations, the paved road looks like this. It's actually not about a paved road. It's about we're going to force developers uh, to do things. So I, I, I think about it as kind of, when it comes to platforms and any kind of abstractions, frameworks, these kind of things, there's, I think, two ways you can approach it. And so some ways are, are going to be disempowering and some are going to be empowering. So in terms of disempowering ways, like we're trying to force the developers to do things properly, right? Especially I've seen this come from, like, say, architect teams and so on and people responsible for governance. We'll give them a platform so they can't do the wrong thing. We're going to make them do it right and not let them do anything else. Um, or we're just going to help developers, you know, because there's a lot of scary things. And so we'll just hide it from them. And, you know, so you don't need to know what's going on underneath. It's just, just, you know, close your eyes, write your code, and, like, stuff will just work. And if it doesn't work, then, well, you're stuffed, right, because you can't see what's going on underneath there. Um, and then if there's, like, new capabilities that you need, well, so you've got to go to the central team um, to provide those and put those, add those into the platform. And until they get, uh, it gets onto their backlog and, and they're able to prioritize and, and make time to do it, then you just have to wait, right? So that's disempowering, right? Empowering is you're not trying to force developers, you're trying to make it easy for them to do things and to do the common things, right? So that they don't have to kind of, um, uh, you know, think about it and, and, and build, you know, reinvent the wheel. And also, there's, I think there's a thing about context, about, it's about like a cognitive load thing, right? So it's like when I'm writing application code, I want to think about the business problem and the business logic and that kind of stuff. And I don't want to have to think about the other stuff. But I do want to be able to switch context. So if I've written my code, and I'm kind of like deploying it and running it and I'm finding out, oh, it's running slowly or whatever. I want to be able to switch context and understand, okay, what's going on underneath? What, how does the, the kind of storage you know, work and the networking and all that? How might that be impacting? And if I need to kind of do something um, differently, I want to kind of be able to understand how to do that in the pieces underneath. Um, and I, I think it's useful to think about how can you enable teams that are using your platform and your platform services and, and pieces and all that you know, how can they uh, themselves, they say, extend things um, or reuse and share things with other teams and so on. Um, so, you know, how can we make sure that they can do that as an empowering thing? So, just to kind of go with that, that centralized platform architecture as a, as a common thing, it tends to limit what teams can de deliver, right? They can only deliver what the platform lets them deliver. Um, and it creates bottlenecks um, for delivering new capabilities. If new stuff comes out, there are new needs. And especially, I think about areas like um, you know, organizations doing things in machine learning and all that, where it's like stuff is changing a lot, and so they need to be able to kind of have, you know, access to new things so they don't kind of fall behind or, or just, you know, get, um, you know, not able to get the most out of what they could get. And so what happens a lot of times in organizations is this kind of drives the important work, the high priority stuff elsewhere. So like, you'll see like an organization where um, they've got the centralized platform team and the CIO has said, I'm gonna, you know, everybody has to use it, the platform team is created, so we have all this kind of thing. And then what happens is you have some work that's a very high priority to the business, some new kind of thing that needs to be done. Um, and the team doing that is saying the platform is slowing us down. It doesn't give us what we want. Um, it's getting in our way. And so then the higher ups say, you know what, just ignore the platform and, and, and do what you need to do because this is too important. And so that tends to happen and it erodes. And so the platform just becomes kind of um, abandoned um, just because they are not able to keep up with what, what um, people need. So. A collaborative kind of approach to
to doing a platform is really about saying, let's have, um, I guess the way to do this is to have um, kind of clear standards, right? So it's thinking about, not about, okay, here's you know, what we're gonna provide for you, but like, if you're gonna build something, whether you're maybe a platform team, or like a, if you have kind of, in a lot of cases with larger organizations, it makes sense not to have a single platform team, but like different teams who are focused on different areas. But if you're gonna build something that other people are gonna use, um, how do you do that in a way where it's not kind of customized. In order to use your thing, I have to kind of customize my application and, and, and my tooling or whatever to, to, to make use of that. But can we kind of have standards of like, this is how um, like things if we have, uh, if we're creating um, resources that other components or other parts of the system can use, like where do we put those? We put those in a registry or something. Do we have a standard way of doing that? Um, and, uh, you know, and how do you find those if you need to use them? I think there's also something about thinking about those services as kind of domain-based, right? So, so again, rather than the, the single platform team as a, as a thing, um, if you think about you know, teams that have to provide uh, or the, the you know, different kind of capabilities that the platform needs to provide, it might be things like monitoring or observability or identity management or storage or what have you. Um, and it's useful to think about those kind of taking a, looking at domain-driven design is something which is normally applied to the business domain, what you're trying to do for your users and your customers, but are thinking about that for your system as well, rather than what we tend to do, which is to take a technology-focused approach. So, you know, it's moving away from having, you know, here's the Linux team and the, the Oracle team and the Cisco team, and thinking about the teams that are trying to provide a capability regardless of what the technology is. Um, and that also makes it easier to be more flexible and not kind of have to worry about if we're going to deprecate some technology or kind of putting a whole team of people out of work. It's like, oh, no, they, you know, they're still going to be doing the same kind of things. Maybe they're going to use, they, they may decide to use different technologies to achieve it. Um, and again, encouraging teams to, to extend and add capabilities. So in the diagram here, I've got uh, this team here, like it might be the data science team, and they decide, oh, there's a new uh, uh, thing which the cloud vendor is providing for, for kind of doing some cool stuff with my models. Um, you know, we can actually kind of build that as a capability. We can build it in a way that it can eventually be shared with other teams and it consumes other kind of resources uh, provided by their platform teams and all that. Um, and then providing the scaffolding, right, for the changes. And so this is like, if you're doing things like saying, um, you know, we're gonna have ways to integrate different infrastructure built by different teams, uh, you know, it's probably gonna be useful to have some kind of common tooling we can use to kind of deal with that. So the way, in terms of scaffolding, I think there's kind of a couple levels that are interesting to think about. One is that, so what's between whoever's building platform capabilities and services, um, how are those kind of provided to developer teams, um, product teams, what have you, like how are they gonna consume that? And I think that's where you can get things like developer portals can come into this space. There's also the kind of descriptor languages, things like you know Helm charts obviously, or things like um, OAM is, is kind of a, an attempt to kind of define a, you know, a, a standard um, uh, way of, of creating like descriptor languages that you can kind of use um, to work, play at that level. And then below it is what I'm calling infrastructure scaffolding, and that's their infrastructure as code and whatever you use to kind of manage your infrastructure projects, um, that that's kind of assembling what comes from the cloud into kind of useful ways. And I think this was a kind of a shift I had. I, I mostly like, because I do infrastructure as code is my main kind of thing, I was always kind of thinking about it at this level, and then I kind of realized that actually it's useful to think about these kind of two layers as, um, um, as, as being useful. And then if we're doing our infrastructure, we're doing platform services, what we're doing is kind of using you know, this stuff down at the bottom to then kind of provide something for the people at the top that way. All right. Um, and so then how do we do this infrastructure as code bit? Um, uh, as, a, as a way, you know, in a way that we can scale. And by scale, I mean like the numbers of teams and, and applications and products and, and services and so on that are involved, right? So as you get more and more stuff going on, like how can we make sure that our infrastructure code, you know, our code base and all that is um, handling that. And I think the key is in design. And I think particularly it's around taking um, a lot of the lessons that we've learned in software development, software engineering, um, and applying those to infrastructure code. I'm mean, thinking about how do we kind of learn those lessons and make use of them. So uh, if you know Dan North, he's um, recently published um, a, uh, uh, an article on, on Cupid, um, which is about design properties of systems. And he's kind of positioned it as a, uh, you know, moving beyond kind of solid as an object-oriented design 
uh, you know, set of uh, object-oriented design um, principles. Um, and so he lists like a couple of things of like, you want to make sure that um, the systems of your, the components of your system are composable. So you can kind of have different, again, that's, that, that's kind of what I was drawing in those earlier pictures of like different people are building stuff and you can plug them together. He talks about the Unix philosophy, right? Um, which is just that you make, you make small pieces uh, with clear interfaces that you can you know, mix and match in different ways that the, the person making the, the, the piece might not have necessarily intended, but because the interfaces are simple and because what it does is kind of simple and small, that makes it easy to kind of do that composition. Um, predictable, like, so it's just, just that like, you know, things work the way you expect them to work, which is easier with simple things and small things. Um, idiomatic just means when it comes to things like building uh, you know, frameworks and tooling and stuff over, say, a cloud or infrastructure, uh, as code kind of platforms and all that. It's like you know, avoiding coming up with something completely different that doesn't work the way that somebody coming into your organization might not expect because you've, you know, you're, you're trying to do something kind of clever. Um, you know, try to kind of go with the flow and go with the grain or, or you know, whatever um, metaphor you want to use. Um, <clears throat> and then domain-based, um, again, which is what I was saying earlier, um, which is just thinking about your design in terms of fitting the domain of the people who are using it. Um, so then, again, like he's, he's kind of, um, Dan's kind of come at this with the approach of thinking about um, software design, but like, you know, it's infrastructure. Infrastructure as code means our infrastructure is software, really. So let's think about it the same way. And so to give a little bit of an example of, of like how I think this can kind of come together or how it, you know, how it can come together is um, uh, I was playing around with an example of using um, a static website hosting, right? And when I host, I've got a couple of websites I'd like to host them on, and I do host them on S3 um, on AWS. Um, so can I make like a nice little kind of uh, um, code base that kind of um, you know, implements that in, in following these kind of the, the approach that I'm talking about? Um, and so the idea is that we've had the, the website content kind of acts like the application in this, in this case. Um, so like generate, use Jekyll, generate content and, and, and upload it to the bucket. And then, um, so static website hosting is like the service as a whole. And then I'm gonna use these different, you know, I use these different elements um, from AWS, these different resources. Um, to put together to provide this service. So in terms of infrastructure code, starting out, I think about it as a, you know, it's a single project, right? I have a, a Terraform project with all of these kind of things that, you know, creates these things for a website. Um, and I'm referring to this project as a, as a stack, right? Um, and so just the reason I do that is because when I talk about these stuff, it's the concepts I'm talking about should apply uh, across different tooling and across different cloud platforms and all that. So um, there's not really a common term for it a, a project that is independent, an infrastructure project that is independently deployable. I mean, CloudFormation and, and Plumi both use the term stack. Terraform just talks about projects and you have state files, which is kind of the analogous thing. Um, but I use the, stack, the term stack just generically. So when I say that, that's what I mean. Um, an architectural quantum comes from uh, the Evolutionary Architectures book, which talks about designing systems um, for change. Um, and they, they use this in the sense of they talk about, say, a monolithic architecture, the quantum is kind of the whole application, right? You deploy the whole thing at once. Microservices is moving to very small uh, quanta where you have like, you know, small pieces that you can deploy separately, <coughs> independently of one another. And so an infrastructure stack is basically one of these things, the infrastructure resources that you define, provision, and, and manage as a group. Um, now, when I remember I was talking about how our, our code base, we code sprawl with our infrastructure code bases. You know, this is what tends to happen is like you've got this project and it might grow and grow as you realize you need to add more and more things to it. Um, and so, you know, how do we handle that, right? How do we handle like that, that project that takes two hours to run Terra from apply? What do we do to kind of, um, you know, break that up, right? Um, so obviously the bigger the project gets, it takes a long time to apply your changes. Uh, the risk, like what you touch when you, what you could touch when you make a change, even if you don't mean to, is larger because anything in that project, you might be just changing this one part but you never know if there's gonna be some ripple effect or something that's been changed, I don't know, in the tooling or providers or whatever underneath that means actually something different changed that you didn't expect. Um, and so it's harder to kind of find and fix problems. You know, you run it and there's a failure and you gotta kind of really sift through everything that's going on. And then again, when you fix things, you might worry about, I'm gonna break something else. Um, so these create barriers to, to, to change and then barriers to kind of improve and, and grow and all that kind of thing. So, uh, so a lot of people, turn to modules, right? Especially with Terraform, there's modules. With other languages, there's libraries, right? So you think this is a way to organize that big, messy project. And it's great in that it helps you to organize your code. It gives you a way of, of structuring code 
um, and breaking it up a bit. But it doesn't, um, well, first of all, it adds moving parts, right? Because you have like versioning of the modules and these different things that you have to kind of pull together um, and work out, uh, you know, whenever you're kind of running it. And so that gets kind of some com complexity that's added there. But it doesn't re this, reduce the scope of the change, right? So you still, when you run that Terraform apply or equivalent command, you're bringing all those modules together and, and, and applying them as a unit. And so again, different things might change. Um, uh, you know, and mess up your code, or it just and it can still take. It'll still take that two-hour Terraform project isn't going to be reduced in time by breaking it into modules. So again, modules might actually add a little extra barriers to change. I'm not like I'm not really anti-modules. It's like they can be useful again for organizing your code, but they're, to me, they're not really the solution um, to these problems that we see. So I see the solution is actually breaking your infrastructure project into multiple stacks. <clears throat> so taking that one big stack there and saying, let's break it out into some smaller pieces, right? Maybe we have one project that's just going to define the S3 bucket. Another one that's going to define, I've got some IAM roles uh, that, that you know, give permissions to upload content into the bucket. Um, and then I've got my, all my networking stuff, Route 53 for, for um, uh, CDN, or sorry, for DNA, DNS. And I've got um, CDN and all that kind of stuff. Um, now, doing that obviously adds complexity. It, it moves the complexity, I would say, to the boundaries between the stacks. Because right? again, I want to make sure that we can deploy these things, change them independently, not having to change them all together as a group. And so we have to manage these independencies. So we've got you know, uh, the you know, resources that some of these, these you know, that one project is creating a, a resource that another one needs to use, right? So, so how do we manage that? That's coupling that's happening there, right? Um, and so we kind of want to move the, then those dependencies to the boundaries of the stack of our project as parameters, basically. Um, and say that way we can kind of define what are the dependencies between, you know, for this thing as a whole. And so then we have some independence of what we do inside that now. Um, and then use software design principles to reduce coupling. So that goes back to Cupid and even some of the things from Solid. So to give an example here, uh, one common um, practice that we use and that you'll see tutorials recommending you use is, well, let's say I've got a, a, um, um, I have one project that's creating all my network structures and it's doing it in really kind of you know, nice, secure and, and, and solid way of setting up my VPCs and subnets and all that. And I've got another project that's creating something that's going to run inside uh, you know, one of those subnets. So a common thing to do is to say, in my, if I'm going to have an EC2 instance maybe that needs to be deployed into a subnet, um, I'll have it look it up, right? I'll, I'll use like a, in Terraform, it's a data construct that says, I know... Uh, maybe what you've named it, or I know uh, how you've tagged it, whatever, but I know some, you know, you've created, I know how you did it, basically, right? And so your code is now coupled to the implementation of the other project. Um, so I think, thinking about things like, say, uh, in, in software, we started doing uh, some time ago dependency injection and saying, rather than my code going and finding the dependent, its dependencies, um, let me just kind of inject it in. Um, let me have like, so if I've got a script that, that, that runs my Terraform, um, it's going to know, you know where to find uh, the dependencies created by another project and put them in there. And that means I can do things like um, testing, right? I can say I don't actually need to stand up my whole big uh, you know, networking stack with all the kind of security and, and, and you know, bulletproof stuff that, that goes on in there. In order to test it, I can just have like a simple thing which just creates a subnet and pass it in to the, the stack. So I can still test that stack on its own. Um, yeah, and also you can, you can avoid um, coupling to the infrastructure implementation of the other stacks. So it might make sense that I'm, right, I'm using Terraform to build some of these, but like one of them I might say, well, this one needs to be a bit more dynamic and it's easier. I find it easier to do that uh, with something like Pulumi or CDK or whatnot. So you can implement these, each of these stacks in whatever technology is the most appropriate um, and not have to worry about, well, that's going to break things that depend on it that expect me to have done it in a certain way. And so in terms of how to break things up, um, there's a few kind of um, forces, I guess, which might, you might um, uh, come into play. Um, okay, I'm <laughs> I'll try a little bit quick. Um, so basically, one is the speed and frequency of changes. So with my hosting stack, I found that like things to do with SSL certificates and, and some of the networking take way longer. Um, and so it's nice not to have to run um, those stuff every time, those things every time. Might have just different data persistent strategies. So where I have S3 buckets or maybe I have storage for a database and all that. Um, I've had projects where uh, I made like EBS volumes 
in a separate project and then attach them to an EC2 instance so I could rebuild the server when I needed to, um, but I didn't have to kind of, you know, you know, necessarily lose the data, but also I could use different strategies. When I make a change um, to a stack that, that has persistent data in it, I can do things like back it up first and then restore it when I recreate it or what have you and not have to worry about running that stuff or deciding whether to run that stuff for the other one. So that kind of makes that easier. Um, risk and governance of changes. So there might be like an infosec team wants to kind of uh, me to run certain checks before I make changes to my, my um, IAM roles and so on. And so I can do that. Um, and then have different teams um, have ownership of different stacks so that you don't have one of those things with those bigger projects is you have multiple teams who might need to make changes to that to support the work they're doing. And so you get kind of bottlenecks and need to add a whole lot of governance around that. Um, use pipelines for infrastructure code for those stacks. Firstly, for, for each stack by itself, test it by itself, make sure it's possible to test it by itself because that kind of enforces that decoupling or loose coupling of saying I am able to, you know, if you're not able to, to take a particular stack and stand it up and test it on its own, then maybe there's a design issue there and you can think about, well, what can I do? What can we do to, to make it so that it is possible to do that? Um, and you can use um, basically test fixtures. I kind of touched on the idea of like, you know, poking in a subnet that we create just to test that one stack. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. And then like, yeah, you bring them together. So for my website hosting bucket, like after a, a change to one of these projects has been tested and went through its own pipeline, then I can test the whole thing together and just run tests that apply to the whole thing. Um, and if it fails, I know that it's like, okay, there was only one change. One of these things changed for this particular run of my test. So I know that's where to look. And so that helps make it easier to fix um, problems. Multiple environments, um, don't do snowflakes as code, which is like whether it's by folders or branches, having separate code for each. It's fine to use. Uh, you know, branches or whatever as a way of promoting code, but like don't have differences between them. Don't say our process is we, you know, uh, merge to one branch and then edit it to, to customize it for the environment. That snowflakes as code. Um, instead, promote stack code across instances without changes. If you need to have variations on things like, say, cluster side or whatever, use parameters for those. Um, Version numbers on infrastructure code is something that isn't often done, but I think it's useful, especially if you then poke it somewhere into your, your instance so you know what version of code was run against this instance, you know, so you can, it's easier to debug problems. Deliver your stacks independently. So you really want kind of pipelines that can push things into production without having to coordinate across everything because that just slows things down as things grow. And that's it. This is just a reiteration of the kind of three main themes um, of what I've been talking about. So, <laughs> thanks. <laughs>